let's discuss the muscular system. It's going to be presented in three parts. We'll start with muscle terminology, moving on to axial muscles, and then we'll finish with appendicular muscles. For muscle terminology, we'll discuss the arrangement and relationships of muscles. Skeletal muscles move or stabilize joints. They have bony attachments via attendons or aponeuroses. Usually the stationary or proximal attachment is the origin, and the more distal or moving portion is the insertion. However, there are exceptions to this. Muscles have fiber segments that are arranged in various ways which affect how it develops force. Most people are familiar with the fusiform muscle that bulges in the middle. Pennate muscles have fibers that radiate off a tendon in a manner similar to a feather. Convergent is like a fan, where it has a wide base of origin and narrows down to a single attachment. Quadrate is flat with four equal sides, while circular goes around an orifice and is more commonly known as a sphincter. Some muscles have more than one muscle belly with more than one attachment point. I want you to be aware of the variations in fiber arrangement, but your examination questions will be focused on the location and action of the muscles, not their shape. Some terminology to help you understand relationships between muscles with similar functions. The prime mover is the main muscle doing an action, which is usually the biggest muscle. A synergist is a muscle that assists with the movement. A muscle that does the opposite motion is the antagonist. An example of these terms can be applied to the motion of plantar flexion, where you stand on your tiptoes. You have two large muscles that make up your calf on the back of your leg. These have similar actions. In this case, in the standing position with the knee straight, the green muscle, gastrocnemius, is the agonist or prime mover, while the blue muscle, the soleus is the synergist, as both help to pull the heel up and point the toes downward. The muscle in red on the front of the lower leg would lift the toes, so it would be the antagonist. In the opposite motion, dorsiflexion, or lifting the toes up, the muscle on the front of the calf is now green, and it is the agonist or prime mover, while the calf muscles on the back are the antagonist. Moving on to our axial muscles. There are many muscles on the face and we're going to cover a few of them here. Occipital frontalis begins with the muscles on our forehead and it has also muscles on the back on our occipital area. They are connected by an aponeurosis. So when you lift your eyes up in surprise, often you can feel the back of your head also shrugging because this is contracting. Orbicularis oculi is around your eyes, while orbicularis oris goes around your mouth. The buccinator is a muscle deep inside and it helps hollow out your cheeks as well as help move food around while you're eating. Zygomaticus is a muscle that's coming from the apples of your cheek or your zygomatic bone to the corners of your mouth. It helps you smile. Then there's depressor labi inferioris. It goes to lowering your lower lip, and so it's a muscle located down underneath this orbicularis oris muscle. Here we can see the facial expression that each of these muscles make. Occipital frontalis for our surprise look, zygomaticus for our smile, depressor labi inferioris for depressing our lower lip like in a pouty face, Orbicularis oculi, as if we're going to squint or wink at somebody. Buccinator, compressing our cheeks against our teeth while we're eating or even whistling. And then finally, a pucker with orbicularis oris. There are two muscles of mastication that you're responsible for. The, the masseter along the mandibular ramus, shown in green, and the temporalis in blue along the surface of the temporal bone. Both of these help to elevate the mandible and crush food. The platysma muscle is a thin muscle starting from the corners of the mouth and down the anterior surface of the neck. You can demonstrate this muscle by splaying out the corners of your mouth and you will see the edges of the platysma protruding on your neck. 
we can see here the area that the platysma covers. As the platysma is so thin, it's rarely dissected on a cadaver, as the muscles beneath are more important for movement of the head and neck. The sternocleidomastoid muscle starts from the mastoid process of the temporal bone and splits into two heads as it descends, attaching to the medial part of the clavicle and the manubrium of the sternum. When one side is activated, it causes the head to turn toward that side. When both sides are activated, it causes the head to flex forward. Scalenes are deeper muscles that attach to the first two ribs. Scalenes can flex the head to the side or be used for inspiration to help elevate the upper two ribs and aid in lung inflation. Here we see the three main muscles of respiration, although we will talk about some additional muscles for more active inspiration and expiration. The most important muscle of inspiration is the diaphragm. It divides the thoracic and abdominal cavity and at rest is in an upward dome-like position. From this view, the diaphragm begins here. When the diaphragm contracts, it moves in the direction of the arrows, dropping down, increasing the size of the thoracic cavity. To exhale, all you do is relax the diaphragm and it pushes upward, returning to its dome shape and pushes air out as it does. Because exhalation is part of the relaxation of the diaphragm, it is considered passive. The intercostal muscles also aid in respiration. The external intercostals in green help to elevate the ribs by further expanding the thorax and help bring more air in. The intercostal muscles in blue help to pull the ribs back together and aid in forcing more air out during expiration. The effect of the external intercostals enlarging the thoracic cavity is demonstrated by a bucket handle. When in a deflated position, the handle and ribs are in a downward position. To aid in inspiration, external intercostal muscles will pull on the ribs, lifting them, and just like a bucket handle, it lifts up and away from the bucket, effectively enlarging the thoracic space, which will pull even more air into it. Scalenes can also aid this process with the first two ribs. This is known as active inspiration as it brings in more air than just the contraction of the diaphragm alone. Additional muscles to aid in active inspiration to help expand the thoracic cavity when a very large breath is being taken are listed here. If air is wanted to be expelled more forcefully than a regular breath out by the relaxation of the diaphragm, then the internal intercostal muscles can compress the thorax. The internal intercostal muscles pull the ribs downward to force more air out. For more forceful expiration, the abdominal muscles come into play to further push the diaphragm upward even when you pull, bend yourself more forward. The main muscles of normal breathing and their role in respiration are shown here. Again, we see the muscles for normal breathing in and out. On to the muscles of the trunk, starting with the abdomen. Here are the four muscles we will discuss. The rectus abdominis is also known as a six-pack muscle. It is made of segments of muscle embedded in a wide tendon sheet called an aponeurosis. This muscle will cause flexion of the torso. There are two oblique muscles. The external oblique muscle has a fiber orientation like a V. The internal oblique muscle has an opposite fiber orientation, which is like an A. Together, these muscles can either turn the torso or work with the rectus abdominis to flex the torso. The deepest of the four abdominal muscles is the transversus abdominis. This helps you suck in your belly as if you were tightening a belt. In summary, we can see all four of the muscles here. They are listed in the order of their layer from superficial to deep. On to the back muscles that move the trunk. There are several deep back muscles. The only one we will introduce is the erector spinae group. 
This muscle has three distinct groups, but collectively they attach from the sacrum and iliac crest and reach up to the transverse and spinous processes of various vertebrae, as well as ribs, and even the back of the head to help us lift and extend the back. So in summary for the axial muscles, you should know the muscle's name, location, and action. You should be able to identify them by description or in a diagram. For each muscle you name, you should be able to name a function or action.